today um, and for the next uh, two days also, I will be talking about codes for post-processing your simulations. So, I mean, it isn't already enough for you guys to go out and spend, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, running a numerical simulation, hundreds of thousands of CPU hours, but I'm going to also then try and convince you that when you're done with all that, you should do an extra step, which is to post-process it and generate some metrics which can be useful comparisons for uh, comparing with real observations. So today I'm going to talk about uh, gas line transfer with RADMC3D. And here's a, uh, just a quick example with what you can do with it. You can model molecular line emission. And here's H12CO plus and H13CO plus. Uh, the first a rotational transition this is showing you the integrated intensity. So this is a, um, a forming protostar launching an outflow. So you can kind of see these very nice cavities which show up in the HCO plus emission. And so the goal of doing this is to compare directly with what observers have in terms of their uh, data, particular molecules, particular transitions that they're studying. All right, so here's my outline. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you why you should model lines, uh, talk about some molecule basics. If you already had ISM, then you probably knew all this stuff, and a lot of it you know, comes from basic quantum mechanics, which you probably had as an undergrad. Then I'm going to introduce you to RADMC3D. Now note that I am not the code developer for RADMC, uh, so this really is also a user's perspective, just like Ro uh, Roby's talk was. I'm going to have an aside into non-LTE line methods. Uh, RADMC3D can do a number of things. One of the nicer things it can do is non-LTE. Um, so I'll go into that, and then finally I'll give you a suggested project for you to try out uh, after the talk in the afternoon. So why model molecular lines? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, molecular clouds are, well, molecular, and so a lot of the gas <coughs> is in these different molecules. Now, unfortunately, H2 is the most common one, uh, but it doesn't have a dipole moment, and as we learned last week, its first transition is actually uh, at around 500 Kelvin. So it's just not uh, well excited in these cold clouds. So as a result, you're kind of stuck with CO, which has an abundance of maybe one part in 10 to the 4. So it's really, you're looking at a really tiny fraction of the mass in these clouds. But nonetheless, you can get a lot of information out of that. So here's an image of the torus molecular cloud. This is in 12 CO, 1 to 0. And what they've done here is they've taken the CO emission and they've uh, divided it into three colors. So red shifted, blue shifted, and in the middle, some um, green emission showing you kind of intermediate velocities. So what you can see by doing this uh, experiment is that there's a ton of velocity structure. There's all these filaments in here. You know, this cloud is very turbulent. And you can really pick out uh, all of this information just from looking at the CO. Now, another nice thing is that you have a lot of kinematic information. So if you look at line of sight spectra, you can see these line profiles which tell you about the temperature and velocity distribution along the line of sight. So then these molecules are telling you directly about the gas kinematics, densities, and temperatures of the cloud. Now, you still might not be convinced that you should take your nice, pure numerical simulations and um, you know, post-process them to get this very messy line information. But if you don't believe me, you might find yourself acting out this parable of the blind astronomers and the elephant. So this happens because you will try and model some object like a molecular cloud. You will go to your favorite observer friends and you will say, tell me, what is the mass of the elephant? What is the cloud mass? What is its velocity dispersion? What is its size? And in fact, they will tell you some distribution of masses, sizes, and velocities. But what they're really telling you is probably about the CO legs of the elephant. They might be telling you about the N2H plus tail of the elephant. And so unless you do these um, post-processing to get this data in an observational regime, you'll have a very difficult time actually comparing with real data. All right. 
So now for some molecule basics. So molecules in these clouds can have several different kinds of transitions. Uh, the first one is an electronic transition. So basically, the electrons change their energy state. These typically correspond to higher temperatures, uh, shorter wavelengths, for example, the H2 Lyman and Werner bands, which are near about 1,000 angstroms. The second thing the molecules can do is vibrational transitions. So again, these correspond to warmer, uh, warmer gas temperatures. And an example is the CO first vibrational transition, about 4.6 microns. And then finally, uh, you have rotational transitions. So these are the lowest energy transitions at the longest wavelengths and correspond to the coldest um, excitations. So that's a, an example of a, a rotating molecule. All right, so if you had uh, an ISM class, then you probably uh, saw lots of these types of energy level diagrams. Here's one from CO. So it basically is telling you the distribution of rotational states here, a uh, number of the first excited states, and at the higher energies you go on to vibrational and then electronic states. And then finally, at some very high energy, the CO is dissociated. So again, CO is the most common molecule you'll probably deal with if you're looking at large cloud structure. And it really is because H2, which we would all prefer to look at, um, is really practically invisible in these clouds. OK, so one important quantity you might want to consider uh, for determining what molecule you want to look at and when you want to look at it is something called the critical density. Now, this is the density at which collisions balance spontaneous emission. So it's given by Einstein A over kind of mean velocity times the collisional cross-section of the molecule. Now, the reason this is important is if um, at lower densities, collisions are rare, so really what is coming out, what is regulating the emission of these photons is really spontaneous uh, emission from the Einstein A. And that corresponds to a time scale to be quite long. So that means that you know, even if the molecule is there, you're just, uh, it's not being excited and you just can't see it. However, once you get to this critical density, now collisions begin to regulate the process of molecular excitation. So that means you approach this LTE when you have um, the gas coming into equilibrium and really now it's the collisions that are exciting it and the dominant thing that determines the uh, excitation is the gas temperature. Okay? So now above this critical density is strongly excited and you can actually learn something about the local temperatures. So molecules with different uh, critical densities can then be used to probe different densities of gas. For example, n crit for CO is about 700 particles per centimeter cubed, so kind of a lowish uh, mean density of a cloud. Uh, HCN, by comparison, has a critical density of about 10 to the 5. So you might be using this to probe uh, higher densities or core gas. And it's not that HCN is not present at lower densities or in the rest of the cloud, it's just not that it's strongly very excited. So you just don't see it at all. So then if you're trying to do a problem where you're um, post-processing the simulation, you want to determine the most useful tracer. So you might consider uh, what is the critical density of the gas? What range of densities do you want to model? What is the local gas temperature in the simulations? So which molecules have transitions there? And what is the optical depth? So if, uh, for CO, if you're trying to probe higher densities, the optical depth becomes large and the CO line becomes saturated, so you can't really learn very much about the gas. Now, this is a lot of work, so you might also just ask an observer about what tracers they're using for a particular regime. Yes, Peter. Uh, Stella, what is the value that the A sub IJ takes on the equation? Yeah, so that varies depending upon the molecule and the transition. So typical values might be like 10 to the minus 7 or 10 to the minus 8, 1 over seconds. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you where you find that um, value on the next slide. So if you want to determine these fundamental properties for different molecules, there's a very, hand a very handy astrophysical website called Lambda, which is a Leiden Atomic and Molecular Database. And they've compiled a whole set of different uh, useful um, molecular information 
including these different energy levels like we saw a couple slides ago, statistical weights, these Einstein A and B coefficients, and these collisional cross sections. So this is probably the first place to start looking if you want to be modeling molecular lines. And it will also include some nice atomic data files. All right. So now we get to the radiative transfer part. So how do we actually model these molecular line transitions? Well, this is an equation that we saw the previous week. Um, basically, the radiative transfer equation, which is just telling you the rate and change of intensity along a ray is simply equal to the emissivity minus the absorption. Okay? So this is applicable for standard radiative transfer, and it's also applicable for lines. So now if you're looking at a particular line, then you want to solve this radiative transfer equation at a particular frequency, the line frequency that you want to model. So in the case of particular lines, the emission and absorption are given by these two formulae. So they depend upon the local gas density, the level populations I and J, and these Einstein A and B coefficients. Um, the last term, this uh, phi, is actually the line profile function. Okay? So if the gas is just sitting there at some temperature, then it's basically like a Gaussian. Okay? And the width is given by the local gas temperature, the sound speed. Now, most of the gas in clouds is not just sitting there. Um, there might be some turbulence. The turbulence can take two forms. It can be unresolved turbulence, so something that's happening below the resolution of the observational beam or even below the resolution of your numerical simulation. So then you can add this you know, extra missing turbulence in quadrature and get a slightly broader line profile. Now the other thing that the, the gas is doing is it might be uh, having large scale bulk motions, in which case your line profile function picks up this velocity term here, so V over C. Okay? So this gives you an effective broadening for your particular line transition. Now one note here is that RADMC, which we're going to be talking about today, is doing the simplest possible thing and is not including overlapping lines. So hopefully you're looking at one line at a time and you don't care if it's um, interacting with its neighbor. And hopefully for standard lines like CO1 to 0, that's not happening, so you don't need to worry. Okay. So RADMC. Now, as I said, um, I am not the primary developer of RADMC 3D. I am a, simply a user. Um, and you can find RADMC 3D on this website. And the developer is Keys Dulamont. He's right here. Keys is quite friendly and um, is happy to take questions. So at the end of this lecture, if you have any questions for me, you can simply email Keys about uh, what you want to know. Um, so Keys uh, actually has not developed the code single-handedly, but in fact there are a number of different collaborators who've add, added specific aspects to the code. So that means that if you, for example, are learning to use RADMC and you see that it doesn't do something that you want it to do, you are free to add that functionality. And I'm sure Keys would actually be very happy to have additional people uh, using and developing the code further. So there's actually a huge number of capabilities uh, that this code does. And in fact, it doesn't just do uh, gas line transfer, which is what we're going to be talking about today. It actually does dust continuum, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. And it also has a huge a number of capabilities in various states of being finished and well tested, some in beta values, and some that are in the process of being developed or for the future. So you can actually see you know, what Keys is planning to do with the code over time. OK, so just a general overview of what RADMC 3D can do. Uh, well, it does uh, deal with dust. So you can compute dust temperature and uh, properties. And this uses a Monte Carlo approach, which is what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. Um, it can compute spectrum, or SEDs. Uh, it can compute images, for example, here. And the images are computed via ray tracing. So after you do the radio transfer, then you can integrate the emission and get a synthetic image. It can also compute the local radiation inside the model. So 
you might wonder why you're, you might want to do this. Um, if you have some external sources and you want to determine what the distribution of radiation is inside the model, for example, if you want to compute chemistry in post-processing, then this could be a handy feature to take advantage of. And finally, uh, right, so you can actually do volume rendering. And there is a movie mode, so you can make something like this. Now, I, I personally use YT, so I'm not sure if this functionality is um, better than YT's volume rendering functionality, but it is an option. And basically, you can get volume rendering anytime you're doing any kind of ray trace radiative transfer, because it's a simple extension of that. So uh, RADMC is also um, adapted to use a number of grids. It can do Cartesian and spherical in 1D, 2D, or 3D. If you have a problem with a huge amount of dynamic range, you can actually do a logarithmic space grid uh, using the spherical geometry. Uh, it also does adaptive grids. Uh, so it has a regular grid, which is just your fixed grid, that has two different types of AMR type grids. On one side, it can take as an input Flash or Ramses. And these are the octree code, uh, octree uh, basis for the grids. And according to the user manual, this is not user friendly. So I know you guys are using these, these codes, so you can take a stab at that um, and see how well that works. Uh, but instead, the, the user manual actual, actually rep, uh, recommends that you do a layer grid because it says it's easier to handle by the human brain which is probably correct. Um, the downside to that is that while it's easier for you to construct this and the inputs, it is redundant. So basically, you input all the data on level zero, then you input all the data in your level one and level two patches, and the data completely overlaps. So it could end up being a larger memory problem. RADMC then sorts out the grids and then just takes the stuff on the top levels to compute the radiative transfer. Um, so this is worth trying if you have the time. I'd just be uh, curious to find out how that goes if somebody does want to try that as, um, as the input. All right, so RADMC has a number of different lines modes to choose from. The simplest is the LTE, which is the default method. So as we discussed um, last week, uh, in LTE, the populations are computed purely as a function of gas temperature. So here, the ratio of the emissivity to the absorption, that is the source function, is simply the Planck function. So it depends only on the gas temperature. And in this situation, the level populations are given uh, purely by this exponential e to the minus h nu over kt. So this is the simplest possible uh, mode for RADMC. The next one is a user-defined population. So if you have some information <clears throat> about the distribution of um, the excitation of whatever you're modeling. You can put that in by hand. So you might have that information because you know something from observations, or you might be comparing RADMC with another code that's already pre-computed the level populations. <clears throat> so one of the last options is doing the non-LTE or large velocity gradient method, <clears throat> which is also called the Sobolev approximation. So in this method, it requires uh, both the gas temperatures and the gas velocities everywhere in the grid. <clears throat> and then RANMC computes the angle average velocity gradients. <clears throat> so I'll just diverge to talk about non-LTE for a minute. <clears throat> so in non-LTE, what you're going to solve is the equation of detailed balance, which is an equation that basically says that the rate of excitations is equal to the rate of de-excitations. Okay, so in this equation, you're balancing all forms of excitation and de-excitation. So you have the Einstein A's from I to J and J to I. You have your spontaneous, or um, your stimulated emission from the radiation field these Bij and Ji. And then finally, you have collisional excitations and de-excitations. Now, in this scenario, um, the source function is no longer a nice, simple Planck function, but instead depends upon the populations in each of the levels and the Einstein A and Bs. <coughs> so if you want to solve this in the large velocity gradient approximation, 
um, you have to take into account the distribution of velocities and how they vary as a function of space. So first I'm going to try and explain that qualitatively and then show you how that fits in with these equations. So imagine <clears> that you have a blob of gas moving with some velocity v1. This gas then emits a photon with frequency nu. Okay. Now this photon continues propagating through the, the domain and encounters a blob of gas moving at a different velocity v2. So the question is, does this photon interact with this new blob of gas or does it escape? So basically, what is the probability of being absorbed by this blob of gas? Now, if these two blobs are moving at similar speeds, then the probability is quite high. But if they're moving at very different speeds, then this emitted photon is Doppler shifted with respect to this other blob of gas, and it has a high probability of escaping. Okay? So whether that happens depends upon the kind of uh, the distance between these two blobs and uh, their two velocities. So you can see there's a gradient that's um, inherent in this problem. OK. So the escape probability of this photon has been codified using this, simul uh, this formula beta. Now beta here is really an arbitrary function. And the important point is that it goes to two different limits. Okay? So when the optical depth is high, then beta goes to zero. Okay? So in high optical depth, the photon is not going to escape. It is going to be absorbed uh, with a very high probability. <clears throat> but in the other case, when the optical depth is small, then this goes to um, one over tau. Um, so then in that case, the photon has a very high probability of escaping. So in this formula, tau is given by not just uh, the standard optical depth, you think of kappa times dr, but depends upon this velocity gradient. So it depends upon the number density, the Einstein A, the frequency, and most importantly, this gradient. Okay? So if the velocity gradient is small, again, that means tau is large. It's highly likely to be absorbed. If the gradient is very large, then the photon is Doppler shifted and will probably escape. Okay, does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> so another function that's important to consider um, that RADMC can do is something called Doppler catching. Now this is implemented to try to account for discontinuous velocities on the grid. So in these setups, the velocity is inherently discontinuous because you're solving the radio transfer on a grid. So each grid cell has a different discrete velocity. So here's the problem. So suppose you have these different grid cells, and here's velocity or frequency going up here. So if you have two cells here with uh, two different velocities down here, and cells up here with different velocities here, then you can have a photon with a kind of intermediate frequency just escaping the grid very easily and not interacting at all. Okay? So discontinuities can be quite uh, bad here. What you can do is instead turn Doppler catching on and basically interpolate between these different velocities in the grid cell. So this is basically going from a kind of uh, first order method to a second order method where you're not allowing these large velocity gradient jumps to happen. Instead, you're taking subsets in velocity space, kind of integrating over the intermediate mass. So <clears throat> then the, there's a follow-up question, which you might be wondering. Should I be using Doppler catching in my problems? And if I should, why isn't this a standard default? Why isn't this always turned on when doing the radiative transfer? And one thing is, well, at second order, it's much slower. But there's a second issue, is that your problem might have shocks. So if your problem has strong shocks, then the velocity discontinuities on the grid are in fact real. Okay? And when you turn this on, you're basically interpolating and smoothing out your shocks. So this is something that's worth keeping in mind, uh, but you also may want to consider that in particular problems, this may or may not be giving you the right answer. And from my perspective, it's a little bit gray. So you might have a problem where you have some velocity jumps that you want to turn this on for, and some where you have strong shocks. So it's something to keep in mind. 
OK, so here's a general schematic of red MC. And basically, you have this block showing you the radiative transfer. But then a lot, of, a lot of the work in setting up and running RedMC is in setting up the initial input files. So these input files can be in ASCII or some kind of Fortran or binary type files. So RedMC comes with a series of IDL libraries, which help set up these pro, uh, files in the appropriate format. Um, and they're for your convenience, but you don't actually have to use uh, IDL. You can use whatever programming language you like to set up these input files. So for example, you can use Python or YT or whatever to set up these files. And likewise, you have a set of output files, uh, which are in similar formats. And again, you can use the libraries that are provided with RADMC to analyze the, um, these files, or you can make up your own data analysis files. And um, really, the RADMC in general kind of has a sparse set of analysis programs. So probably no matter what you, you want to do, you'll probably have to write a little bit of code uh, to do your analysis um, more thoroughly. All right, so there are a number of inputs that you will need when setting up a problem. First, you need to pick a molecule. Um, you then need the densities for that molecule, the temperature, the position, the velocities, if you're doing non-LTE. Uh, if the molecule is being collisionally excited, which in reality it probably is by a number of things, then you also need to specify the information for the collisional partners. So for CO, the most common collisional partner is H2, so that's something you need to add as an input. You'll need to specify the level populations if um, you're not having red MC 3D compute them, some level of microturbulence, that is some subgrid type turbulence that's contributing to the lines. You'll need your molecular line input file. So this is, for example, molecule underscore CO dot IMP. And this is exactly what you can download from the Leiden database. So it's not something you even need to set up. You can just download this file for whatever, whatever molecule you'd like. You'll need to specify a wavelength range, preferably one that overlaps with the frequency that you're looking at. Um, if you're also including dust, you need the dust properties. And finally, there's a set of other radiative transfer parameters, like this Doppler catching parameter, this lines mode, and various other things that uh, basically tell RADMC what you're actually computing and how accurately to compute that thing. So there's a few other details. Um, RADMC is unfortunately not currently paralyzed, so that can make it quite slow. Um, when I'm running it, I found that the largest base grid I can usually get away with is 256 cubed, which might take a few days to run, depending upon the molecule and how quickly things converge. Um, you know, hopefully this is something that, that will actually uh, occur in the future as they will go to a parallelized uh, method, because then you will be able to run much larger grids. Yes? So in this case, I've been running without AMR. I usually use the Orion code, which is not one of the standard inputs. Uh, so I haven't really played around with how much extra refinement you can do, but I imagine the refinement is probably less in number than the base grid. So maybe you can get away with some amount of that. Um, so there are a number of features that are under development. Like I mentioned, one is full non-LTE, not just this large velocity gradient method. Um, and supposedly, RADMC 3D can interface directly with Flash, Ramsey, Zeus, and Pluto. So this is probably worth trying out in this workshop to see how well that works. Um, and finally, if you don't like RADM C3D for some particular reason, um, it doesn't have the functionality you want, uh, you want to try and compare it with other codes, another alternative code which does similar things is LIME, um, this LIME modeling engine which is created by Christian Brinch, and quite a number of people also use that code. So just for uh, comparison. Um, finally, one of the things that you might want to do is create images along a particular line of sight through the code. So once, you, once the code computes the level populations and the intensities in each of the cells, then you probably want to integrate along a line of sight to get some image or spectra. And the way RADMC 3D does this is by this simple formula by adding up the emission, just walking through the cells along a ray. 
And even if you're not doing Doppler catching, there is a flag to make it second order. So depending upon how, um, how coarse your grid is, you may or may not want to smooth out the interpolation to get nicer images. All right. So against my, uh, against my instincts, I've decided to uh, put up some of this code on here. Um, and uh, so now we will stare at this code for the next few slides. Um, and I warn you that this is in IDL. And so if you don't like IDL, you might want to tune out because it's probably obnoxious to look at. Um, but this is one of, the setup, uh, one of the setup files for one of the example problems, okay? This particular problem is a line uh, problem in 3D and it's in the LTE approximation, just very simple. Okay. So in this problem uh, setup file, the first thing you want to do is create your grid. So how many uh, points does it have? What are the size of the grid cells? Um, and what are the positions at each grid point? And then that is being written out in a file amr underscore a grid dot INP, okay? So no matter what code you use to do this, you're basically going to be printing out you know, one line, I format one, next line, no, this is not an AMR code. Uh, next one, this is Cartesian, so it's zero. Grid info is also zero. And then include the X, Y, and Z coordinates. So basically all the input files, no matter what code you're using to set this up, um, will look like this. Uh, the next thing that you uh, will set up in some form or the other is the distribution of wavelengths. This particular setup problem is actually specifically for CO emission, um, but RADMC does dust by default, so you're, unless you turn that off, you're kind of stuck with also setting up dust uh, wavelength information. So for the dust, the file looks like this. You're basically, you can set up whatever distribution of wavelengths you want at whatever increments, that's fine. For the lines, you're going to have a similar file um, as this, except it's going to be called camera wavelength micron.imp. So in that case, you can make a much finer spacing and really cover the line profile that you want to um, image at the end. Next, you have all of your uh, distributions of uh, quantities, such as the dust temperature, the gas temperature, gas velocity, number densities, and they're all in this form. So they're all whatever the quantity is, uh, gas underscore temperature dot IMP, and then you're just writing out this 3D grid. So these are really, really simple setup files. Uh, for the lines, uh, the, the file that you'll have to set up is called lines.imp. And this particular one, it's just modeling the CO. So here it says uh, the CO, the name of the molecule, Leiden, this is the the format of the file that RADMC is going to look for. And then here, these are all zeros. There's no other fancy stuff, no collisional partners. It's just CO. But if you want to set up and include uh, H2 as a collisional partner, which you do because that's really important in molecular clouds, then you will have to say, OK, we have one collisional partner. It's H2. And then you could have um, ortho or para or whatever other distribution of molecules and you know however many of those there are. Okay. And then finally, um, there's kind of a catch-all file which has all the default parameters, uh, radmc3d.imp. And there's a whole set of different parameters that can go in here, including the Doppler catching parameter. Um, this particular um, example problem just has a couple of parameters, and it doesn't even specify the lines mode because it's going to the default value of 1. All right, any questions about that? All right, so once you've set up your input files, then you can just call RADMC3D from the command line. And I've actually set it up for you, so I've installed it in my home directory. It's already compiled, so if you go and log in to Heidi's and do which RADMC3D, you should see it in my home directory and you should be able to directly call it. So one of the nice things about RADMC3D is you don't need to keep compiling it and recompiling it. You can use it as long as you like the functionality that it already has. All you need to do is make the setup files and then call it. You don't actually need to compile anything. So for this example problem, um, which creates the image in CO, 
it's one to zero. Uh, basically says call ren and C3D on the command line, make an image at this particular wavelength, at this particular inclination of, of 60 and 30 degrees. Okay, so this is kind of an off-center uh, line of sight through this 3D cube. Alternatively, you can, instead of saying the particular wavelength, you can just tell it, I want the first uh, transition of CO1. Okay. And then a number of these parameters, like Doppler catching, you can actually specify on the command line if you want to change them from the default values. So it's a really simple calling sequence. Uh, to help you out, um, there's actually quite a number of examples. You can find them in the install in my home directory. Um, and under version 0.35, and the manual for Rad MC 3 d is also there. So if you don't want to um, reinstall it, you can just see all of that stuff there. Um, finally, um, on to the project. So here's what I suggest that you guys do. Uh, pick your favorite molecule from the Leiden database. Maybe you have a problem that you ran last week with Athena, maybe you have a problem you're running this week with Flash, try and figure out a particular molecule that's applicable in that case. If you're looking at a disk, then you probably don't want to model CO. Um, so download that molecule, um, then make setup files from it um, based upon, well, maybe for the first pass, you can do a 1D model or a simple 3D fixed grid. You can look at the examples, that's pretty easy to set up. Um, and then if you want to play around, you can try directly inputting the flash data. So once you make the setup files for your problem, uh, produce a synthetic emission spectra or cube uh, for one transition of the molecule. So you can figure out how to do this by going through the examples like I just did. There's quite a number of them. So you can really just see how to modify those to instead of setting up the data, just read in your own favorite data cube from this past week or two. Um, so, before concluding, I'm going to say one additional word about chemistry. So, in doing these molecular line modelings, basically you need to know information about abundances and the distribution of these different molecules. So, the simplest thing for you to do for these setup problems and what RADMC is doing in the examples is taking a typical mean abundance, which is assumed to be constant over the entire domain. So for CO, that might be one part in 10 to the 4 relative to the mean uh, number densities of the problem. But, you know, there's a warning that in real molecular clouds, the abundance is not constant. In disks, the abundance is not constant. And so by doing this, you're making an implicit assumption that the distribution of molecules is much simpler than it actually, did, actually is. So here's, for example, what happens if you assume a constant abundance. Here's a molecular cloud. This is the integration of, um, this is integrated intensity, and I've post-processed it with both a chemical code to get the distribution of abundances and RADMC3D. So if you assume a constant abundance, you get these solid blue lines, which are filled in. So over here, you can see in the background, there actually isn't very much CO emission because most of it's dissociated. And if you assume a constant abundance, then you get much more emission than is actually there. And as you go through different parts of the clouds, you can see that a constant abundance is a better or a less good approximation. But you will be making this error in terms of comparing with observations unless you do some sort of chemical post-processing. So if you guys are feeling extremely ambitious, then you can, before running random C3D on your problem, you can think back to Paul Clark's lectures last week, use his simple chemical um, modeling codes and actually compute a more realistic distribution of abundances to use before you do the radiative transfer. All right. So here's a set of some useful references. There's a couple by keys that are on the 1D version and 3D versions of RADMC. Um, the LVG, this non-LTE approach, it was developed by Rahul Shetty, and so that's in a paper in 2011, if you want to read a little bit more about that. Uh, the stuff related to the um, molecular and atomic uh, information, most of which is already pre-computed on this Lambda database, can be found in these two papers. Um, various ISM books would be extremely helpful if you want more background reading. 
And finally, if you have any questions about this lecture, then I direct you to email Keyes about it. He's very friendly and helpful. All right, thank you. Yes. So, so this is uh, another comment about YT. I just want to say that uh, it can dump RADMC 3D outputs uh, if from any simulation output. So if you have a simulation you want to, uh, that's not in the format of RADMC 3D, you can read YT convert. That, that was added by Asher Myers. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, usually what I've done is if I've used YT, I've just flattened the data. And then you know, put it in some generic file, and then just read it in with uh, with IDL. But yeah, your way is probably you know takes out an extra step 